When I was here last year, I mentioned, uh, for those of you that were here, I'm repeating myself, that uh, I had recently, at that time, encountered an insightful uh, source on orienting me towards the poet's craft. Uh, and it was a re reprint of several uh, earlier books in the 20th century. The author, whose name was Ivor Winters, contended that uh, despite all of the diverse types of poetry written for the last 2,500 years in the Western tradition, that all of them could be reduced to three categories. Uh, the first one was be one that gave pleasure. And th that doesn't necessarily mean that it made us happy, uh, but like the yarn of the Nancy Bell or even Danny Deaver, it may have there may have been pleasure in hearing, in, in some sense of hearing the resolution of the story. The second kind was that that gave us uh, a way to live. It was didactic. It taught us something. And lastly, uh, the, this professor uh, Winters said, and the, the, the uh, third kind was the romantic style of poetry, which he claimed had been in existence for about 200 and some years. Um, I'd like, again, to borrow the framework for uh, my remaining selections, and uh, I'm going to read uh, three things from the section, uh, the second section of this, that of the didactic or, or poems that try to teach us something. This is uh, entitled, It Couldn't Be Done. Uh, there's a word in here, quit it, which is a real word, which means an equivocation. <clears throat> Somebody said that it couldn't be done, but he, with a chuckle, replied that maybe it couldn't, but he would be one who wouldn't say so till he tried. So he buckled right in with a trace of a grin on his face. If he worried, he hit it. He started to sing as he tackled the thing that couldn't be done, and he did it. Somebody scoffed. Oh, you'll never do that. At least no one ever has done it. But he took off his coat and he took off his hat and the first thing we knew he'd begun it with a lift of his chin and a bit of a grin without any doubting or quit it. He started to sing as he tackled the thing that couldn't be done and he did it. There are thousands to tell you it cannot be done. There are thousands to prophesy failure. There are thousands to point out to you one by one the dangers that wait to assail you. But just buckle in with a bit of a grin. Just take off your coat and go to it. Just start in to sing as you tackle the thing that cannot be done. And you'll do it. Uh, another poem, uh, like the first one that uh, I did that I don't think could be written in this era, as is this one. This is a famous poem by William Ernest Henley, published in 1888. It's called Invictus. Um, the word straight in here doesn't mean straight this way. It means straight like in a challenging passage. The Straits of Hormuz. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the blood bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horrors of the shade. And yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the souls, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Invictus by uh, William Ernest Henley. It's, uh, it's curious that there's a, uh, there's a uh, Netflix hospital series going on and they have a, uh, a dashing uh, African-American black uh, cardiac surgeon who, before he goes into surgery, you'll see him scrubbing down and he recites this and it's, I don't know. I find that I find that uh, so so some of this stuff does hang on after a while. 
Um, this next author is, uh, 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 we're going to do a little longer narrative poem here, uh, is George, by George R. Sims, who died in 1922. Uh, in 1880, he published a book called The Ballads of Babylon, ba Babylon, of course, being a, a biblical reference to a center of luxury and vice in days past. Um, one source contends that during the 1880s, uh, Mr. Sims was more popular than Charles Dickens. We know this as Sims' works were repeatedly republished, that being the only way to get copies of anything back then. Uh, several years after its publication, Mr. Sims traveled to the United States on tour. It is reported that he recited the poem you are about to hear to a group of East Coast, Coast sophisticates. During the presentation, some of the ladies became flushed with embarrassment, then left the room scandalized by the poem's affront to the respectability of Victorian mores. So you've been prepped. Uh, just uh, just four words. Um, uh, uh, Osler, O-S-T-L-E-R. And Osler is a uh, stable hand in a country inn. And the poem actually is called Osler Joe. Magpie is the name of that country inn. Kiss the rod is an old expression meaning accepting punishment submissively. And gloaming is dusk. In the summer, when the meadows were aglow with blue and red, Joe the ostler of the magpie and fair Annie Smith were wed. Plump was Annie, plump and pretty, with a cheek as white as snow. He was anything but handsome, was the magpie hostler Joe. But he won the winsome lassie. They'd a cottage and a cow, and her matronhood sat lightly on the village beauty's brow. Sped the months and came a baby. Such a blue-eyed baby boy. Joe was working in the stables when they told him of his joy. He was rubbing down the horses and he gave them then and there all a special feed of clover, just in honor of the air. It had been his great ambition and he told the horses so, that the fates would send a baby who might bear the name of Joe. Little Joe the child was christened and like babies grew apace, he'd his mother's eyes of azure and his father's honest face. Swift the happy years went over, years of blue and cloudless sky. Love was lord of that small cottage, and the tempest passed them by, passed them by for years, then swiftly burst in fury over their home. Down the lane by Annie's cottage chanced a gentleman to roam. Thrice he came and saw her sitting by the window with her child, and he nodded to the baby, and the baby laughed and smiled. So at last it grew to know him. Little Joe was nearly four. He would call the pretty gemplum as he passed the open door. And one day he ran and caught him, and in child's play pulled him in, and the baby Joe had prayed for brought about the mother's sin. Twas the same old wretched story that for ages bards had sung. Twas a woman weak and wanted and a villain's tempting tongue. Twas a picture deftly painted for a silly creature's eyes of the Babylonian wonders and the joy that in them lies. And he listened and was tempted. She was tempted and she fell as the angel fell from heaven to the blackest depths of hell. She was promised wealth and splendor and a life of guilty sloth, yellow gold for child and husband, and the woman left them both. Home one eve came Joe the ostler with a cheery cry of wife, finding that which blurred forever all the story of his life. She had left a silly letter through the cruel scrawl he spelt. Then he sought his lonely bedroom, joined his calloused hands and knelt. Now, O oh Lord, O oh God, forgive me, for she ain't to blame, he cried, for I ought to seen her trouble and a gone away and died. Why, a wench like her, God bless her. Twasn't like that she'd rest with that bonny head forever on a ostler's ragged vest. 
It was kind of her to bear me all this long and happy time. So for my sake, please to bless her, though you count her deed a crime. If so be, I don't pray proper, Lord, forgive me, for you see, I can talk all right to horses, but I'm nervous like with thee. Ne'er a line came to the cottage from the woman who had flown. Joe the baby died that winter and the man was left alone. Ne'er a bitter word he uttered, but in silence kissed the rod, saving what he told his horses, saving what he told his God. Far away in mighty London rose the woman into fame for her beauty won men's homage, and she prospered in her shame. Quick from lord to lord she flitted, higher still each prize she won, and her rivals paled beside her as the stars beside the sun. Next she made the stage her market, and she dragged Art's temple down to the level of a showcase for the outcasts of the town, and the kisses she had given to poor ostler Joe for not with their gold and costly jewels, rich and titled lovers bought. Went the years with flying footsteps while her star was at its height. Then the darkness came on swiftly and the gloaming turned to night. Shattered strength and faded beauty tore the laurels from her brow of the thousands who had worshipped. Never one came near her now. Broken down in health and fortune, men forgot her very name till the news that she was dying woke the echoes of her fame and the papers in their gossip mentioned how an actress lay sick to death in humble lodgings growing weaker every day. One there was who read the story in a far off country place and at night the dying woman woke and looked upon his face. Once again, the strong arms clasp her that had clasped her years ago, and the weary head lay pillowed on the breast of Osler Joe. All the past he had forgiven, all the sorrow and the shame. He had found her sick and lonely, and his wife he now could claim since the grand folks who had known her, one and all had slunk away. He could clasp his long lost darling and no man would say him nay. In his arms, death found her lying. In his arms, her spirit fled. And his tears came down in torrents as he knelt beside her, dead. Never once his love had faltered through her base unhallowed life, and the stone above her ashes bears the honored name of wife. Hostler Joe, ladies and gentlemen. They don't write up like that anymore. Some would say, for the best. Well, it was uh, I, the uh, the poem that I did from uh, about the hanging. Uh, George Orwell thought that was just pandering to to crass sentimentality. I mean, this is the opposite response of this of the, the this professor who said this is literature at last and.